so that are able to distinguish among these different species. But this is a challenging task because uh, while for chromatography, we have uh, uh, several binding events along the column that allow at the end to separate the two different enantiomers, even uh, small difference in the interaction of the chiral compound with the uh, column, with the stationary phase of the column can allow this separation. Chemical sensor, uh, of course, take advantage of only one binding. Uh, so in this case, the discrimination should be much more uh, efficient. And uh, <clears throat> we started uh, our work trying to uh, repeat in some way what happened in uh, column chromatography, uh, grafting uh, a chiral receptor onto the surface of the gold electrode that are present onto the quartz, uh, onto the surface of the quartz microbials. So we started with this kind of diode uh, formed by two porphyrin linked by this DTN, which is chiral. And it is also important because it is uh, the group that is in charge to graft the, the species onto the surface of the quartz. These uh, uh, devices we work at MAT have uh, uh, an important drawback. Uh, the number of the receptor that we can graft onto the surface of the quartz are small. So the saturation of the sensor uh, was quite immediate. So uh, it was uh, fine uh, for very low concentration of the chiral compound. Then the saturation, of course, removed uh, the, the chiral uh, discrimination power of these devices. So we, are, we were looking for some time for uh, uh, the possibility to uh, develop chiral film, uh, not just a, a single layer, but multi-layer uh, using, uh, using pop film. Uh, the, possibility, the possibility was to uh, use, uh, in some way, to impart some chiral property to the porphyrin, again, including some peripheral groups to these species, and to induce the aggregation to these species in order to have a supramolecular aggregate that can uh, have this uh, chiral uh, property. And this is possible to do just uh, using the good and bad solvent approach. So in, in, in practice, we dissolve the porphyrin in ethanol, which is a good solvent, and then we add water, which is a bad solvent for this species. So the increasing the, the, the amount of water, uh, of course, induce the aggregation of this uh, species, and this, uh, thanks to the peripheral uh, chiral substituent, this uh, aggregate feature uh, supramolecular uh, chirality. And the porphyrin was used as uh, an antenna effect to have uh, this, uh, this signal. And depending on the use of the two different uh, enantiomer of the chiral group at the peripheral position, we can have uh, at the, uh, the circular uh, decreasing spectra, the specular images of the band at the absorption uh, uh, position of the porphyrin. And uh, also the, the same of this uh, uh, aggregate deposit onto the, onto the surface is possible to have uh, this fibrous effect, which is in some way is derived from the fractal aggregation of this uh, of these uh, of these species, so we started to uh, uh, to deposit this film onto the surface of the cores to see if they were able to give chiral discrimination. The surface, uh, the film, uh, in some way preserved the uh, the chiral feature of the of the compound, and we observe in the in the solid state again, the presence of the, of the signal at the circular degree. So the, the chirality was preserved. But unfortunately, when we tried to see if this course was able to discriminate among the two different enantiomer of lemonine, the result was, uh, was no. The, uh, this device has no uh, power for the chiral discrimination power uh, totally. Uh, the reason probably was the formation of this aggregate with our soft matter, so they uh, were not able when swell in the presence of the of the gaseous analyte to preserve this uh, chiral, uh, chiral feature. 
So we try to, uh, to uh, see if it was possible to have a, a more robust surface where the chiral property of the, of the porphyrin should be uh, preserved. And uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles were uh, quite useful for this species because for uh, other study, other studies, we observed that the, these uh, nanoparticles were quite useful to, uh, in some way, form hybrid materials. And depending on the different uh, methodology for the preparation of these hybrid materials, we have different kind of sensing material uh, using just these two different uh, components. Uh, in this case, we used the, we used the, the porphyrin having this carboxylic group at the peripheral position as the unit that can graft the porphyrin, which is chiral, onto the surface of the uh, zinc oxide nanoparticle formed by the hydrothermal uh, approach. And it was uh, quite uh, uh, simple as a, as a preparation. You just have to, uh, to mix together the two porphyrin and then to uh, to make the centrifugation, wash the porphyrin to see that there is a, a thin film onto the surface of the zinc uh, oxide nanoparticle. And this is possible to see how the, uh, the film is onto the surface of the, of the zinc oxide nanoparticle that uh, have uh, uh, a good uh, uh, a good coverage by the porphyrin and also porphyrin I use to glue in some way the different nanoparticles when deposited onto the surface. Uh, this image have been uh, made in collaboration with Dr. Uh, Sivalingam in, uh, in Chennai and uh, it is possible to see that uh, <clears throat> this can allow the formation of this uh, multi-layer surface when the, the, the porphyrin are uh, in some way have a mechanical robustness because of the grafting onto the zinc oxide nanoparticle, it can uh, be used for uh, chiral discrimination. So we started to, uh, to test this possibility uh, comparing the, uh, the property of three different sensing layers. The first one is just the porphyrin, the single porphyrin which is sprayed onto the surface of the quartz. So no aggregation, just the single component uh, deposit onto the quartz surface. The second one, again, the aggregate the, of the porphyrin deposit onto the surface, which will uh, reveal not be useful for this kind of, we want to repeat this, comparing them with the property of the hybrid material, the zinc oxide nanoparticle functionalized with the porphyrin. And, uh, <clears throat> These are the image of this uh, different uh, film. In this case, we have uh, an amorphous structure of just the, the layer of the porphyrin onto the surface. The second one are the aggregate of porphyrin, which has this uh, porous and fractalic uh, aggregation. We are globular aggregate. And the third one were the zinc oxide particle covered by, uh, by the porphyrin film. Uh, the <clears throat> characterization of this film at the circular decrease spectrometer uh, reveal, of course, for the uh, film of the sprayed porphyrin, uh, a silent CD, because in this case there was no supramolecular chirality. In the case of the aggregate, again, we uh, have the, the spectrum, the feature of the spectrum that uh, confirm the chirality of this surface. And the third one, we have, again, with the uh, zinc oxide nanoparticle, the presence of the chiral signal, which is also transferred onto the signal of the zinc oxide. So the, the film of the porphyrin gluing the different zinc oxide nanoparticle have the, the power to induce chirality also in the inorganic material. Okay, so we tested this in the uh, sensor array chamber of the device that we have developed in uh, Tor Vergata with different uh, uh, coarse crystal microbalances, uh, all in the same measurement chamber. And we tested them with uh, uh, two different enantiomer of the line. Uh, the results were that in, uh, uh, in both cases for this, uh, just the porphyrin and the aggregate, we have no chiral discrimination. So the difference were in the experimental error, while a, a significant difference was observed in the case of zinc oxide nanoparticle 
and uh, uh, the hybrid uh, material. So in this case, it was possible to have a film that was able to give a, a significant difference of response among the two different enantiomers of, uh, of lime. And this is the, just the picture of the response of the two different sensors. As we can see the response of the sensor in the case of the, just the portion of the aggregate uh, where no difference among the two enantiomers. This is the difference in the case of the zinc oxide nanoparticle. So this is quite promising for application. This is also, uh, uh, we can follow the, also the response in the case of the circular decroism. We can see that the, in the case of the most responding uh, uh, enantiomer, the variation of the chiral signal is much more important. So there is a, a much more interaction with the preferred enantiomer to the other. And this is a quite uh, uh, promising for future uh, application because we demonstrate that with this hybrid material, we can solve the problem of the uh, softener of the layer and that this can be applied for uh, chiral sensing. And this open also the way to the possibility to develop other uh, hybrid material using uh, different nanostructure. And we, we started, for example, with the silicon, uh, uh, the oxide nanoparticle, because in this case, it's quite simple to make uh, the, the grafting of the porphyrin, and it's possible also in this case to have uh, the different, uh, the preservation of the chiral feature in the solid, in the solid state. Uh, and another approach, which is also interesting, which, which is within a European project in collaboration with the uh, Tallinn University of Technology, uh, we try to uh, use uh, the coupling of two different organic material in this case. These hemicucurbituril species, these which as an internal cavity are chiral species, uh, conjugated with the porphyrin. In some way, the porphyrin can help the uh, interaction with the analyte and the uh, hemicucurbitulil can cooperate in the sensing and also forming the, the chiral film. And in this case, the preparation was quite simple because they have just to mix together in solution the two different component and deposit them onto the surface of the, of the quartz. And in this case, it's possible to see how hemicucurbitulil can induce the chiral signal revealed by the porphyrin. So we have the formation of the chiral layer in a simple way, just evaporating the solvent onto the surface of the quartz. It is possible also to have uh, some covalent uh, conjugation of the two components if we, we have a more robust uh, uh, layer. So we tested this, uh, this species for uh, the chiral discrimination with different uh, in this case, it's possible to do a lot of layer because it, it is possible to uh, manipulate both the porphyrin on the hemicucurbituril structure. And uh, in this case, it's possible also to use the two different uh, enantiomers of the hemicucurbituril and test them for the interaction with the two uh, chiral, uh, the two enantiomer of the uh, target analytes. And in the case of limonene, for example, we have the reverse response when we use the RR enantiomer of... Uh, Excuse me, sir. Sorry to disturb you. Eight minutes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. okay. I will try to the conclusion. In this case, it's possible to see the inversion of the uh, sensitivity to the different enantiomer among the RR uh, layer to respect the SS layer. Okay. So in some way, it's possible to invert the sensitivity to the two enantiomers thanks to the different chirality of the receptor confirming the active uh, response. In the case of non-chiral layer, we have no difference. So we have just the superimposition of the two species. Okay, one, uh, this is the different sensitivity. One objection here can be, okay, you have a, a, a difference among the interaction with the two enantiomer, but how can you discriminate among them if we have a, a mixture of them in, a, in, a, in an environment? And this is true when we use just a single sensor, because of course with a single sensor, we cannot discriminate among them because we, can, we don't know, if we don't, if we don't know the concentration of the two species, we, the response of the sensor, of course, is uh, ambiguous. But if we, uh, and uh, in the ideal uh, approach, 
we have to use two specific sensors that can respond only to one enantiomer and zero to the other. But this is an ideal situation because, of course, we cannot remove completely the non-specific interaction with the other enantiomer. So from a synthetic point of view, this is a very stressful as a condition. And also, it is uh, uh, very difficult when we have different enantiomers to develop a lot of specific sets. But in this case, if you have this broadly selective sensor, we use a, a, a non-chiral sensor, for example, with just these two devices, we can reach the same identification. Uh, in which way? Well, when we uh, measure with uh, this broadly uh, enantiosylic sensor the presence of one enantiomer and the other with uh, an achiral uh, sensor, of course, in this case, the response to the two different enantiomer is the same. In this case, it's different. When we move from the space of the response of the two different sensor to the space of the response of the sensor, of course, we can individuate the response of the chiral sensor of the two different enantiomer uh, in some way, individuate two lines where the two, the response of this uh, sensor are, uh, are present. And in this case, moving from the response of the individual sensor to the space of the two responses, we have this separation of the two enantiomer. So we reach, in this case, in a more simple case with the broadly uh, selective sensor and the uh, uh, chiral sensor, the same uh, discrimination power uh, that we have in the other cases. And if you use two broadly uh, sensors, the difference is that we increase the amplitude of the difference among the two different lines. So we increase the, our discriminating uh, power. And uh, we can use also this uh, uh, situation to individuate, for example, all the mixture where the two different en enantiomer are present in different concentration. And this is important in the environmental uh, field because we can uh, prove in this way the pathway of the, the composition. Excuse me, sir. Last two minutes. Okay. You need to present then interactions. Okay, this is uh, uh, what happened with our sensor, for example, the individuation of the two line with the two different enantiomer of limonin in the case of zinc tetraphenylporphyrin, which is the non-chiral reference. And this is with the, all the data with the PCA, we have an increase of the separation. Okay, so this is approach is the step for the preparation of an electronic nose able to discriminate among the chiral um, the chiral species, we are going to apply this in the uh, in the field in the uh, in this uh, European approach. So thanks to all the group, the sensor group at the University of Tor Vergata, and in particular to Dr. Gabriele Magna, um, Professor Monti, and uh, uh, Professor Manuela Stefanelli for uh, that uh, were more in charge in this particular uh, uh, project and the European project that financed us in this uh, project initiative. And uh, thank you all for your kind uh, attention. Okay, thank you, Professor Roberto, for a nice uh, lecture. May I have some questions from the audience? Any question from the audience? If there is any no uh, questions. Uh, Professor Roberto, I have, I have one or two questions, quick questions. Uh, have you used the effect of metal, central metal, in the four firings on the development of chiral sensors? You have used uh, only zinc in a um, core metal. Uh, no, it, it is possible to use different metals. Uh, mm -hmm. Just changing the coordinated metal into the porphyrin. We use manganese also, we mm -hmm. magnesium, and so on. It depends on the kind of uh, uh, the chiral compound. Mm -hmm. In principle, using the Pearson uh, theory, we can modulate the sensitivity of the porphyrin according to the hard soft acid and base theory. Uh, in this case, for limonin, because in this case we use just limonin because it's uh, cheap in some way, chiral compound that can be. Uh, obtained for two different enantiomers. And in this case, zinc was the, the most efficient. 
but for um, for example for uh, other compound that have oxygen as uh, as a donor uh, for example magnesium is uh, is much better or manganese and so on. so it's possible to uh, to play a lot with uh, using different metals to try to orient the sensitivity of them you have used uh, the zinc oxide nanoparticle and the SiO2 nanoparticles. Which mm -hmm. one is the superior for to make the hybrid system to for the chiral sensors? Uh, okay, uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles are particularly useful. Tell you the truth, we want to test the silicon uh, oxide uh, nanoparticle because they are easier to be prepared in uh, in the homogeneous uh, dimension, and also because they can be used for optical application, because they are transparent. Uh, have you tried this uh, TiO2? Uh, not yet. Oxide? Because they have the same but properties. A good option, of course. No, okay. okay, thank you. Any questions? Any more questions from the audience, from the... Okay, if there are no questions, thanks to the Professor Roberto for a nice lecture and Again, we thanks to the to the professor Avoto. Thank you so much. Uh, should you go to the for the next? So, how is the coronavirus in Italy now? Yeah. Now we can go for the next lecture. Next, uh, there are three oral presentation. First one is the electrophoric deposition of copper oxide nano leaves for organic volatile compound sensing application. The presenter is Anisa. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can. Only eight, only six minutes. Six to eight minutes. So you have to finish your presentation within eight minutes. And after that, two minutes for the discussion. Okay, okay go ahead, Anissa. Okay. Sir, it is visible. No, no, no. We cannot be. We, we cannot see it. Okay. You can share your screen. Yes, sir. I am sharing. Is it visible, sir? Not yet. I think you have opened it as a window. You can go to, to, to share as a window. Okay, sir. You will open your PPT in one, one window yeah. and then share that. Then only it is coming. Yeah, just open your PPT first, then share it. Sir, I Don't close the PPT. window. I think we have closed the window. Yeah, that's not the problem. Yeah. Sir, if you do one thing, you stop uh, uh, sharing that again, you will open yeah, the again, window and then share it. it once again. Sir Marshall, can you make her as a co-host? I don't think so. Then only... Because I do not have a... Yeah, a, that's what uh, I... The, the PPT of One second, sir. I will... Or you can, you, can, you, you can do it. 
Yeah, I will do it. Yeah. Yeah, one minute, sir. On the screen, share panna mudi illa. No, on the screen, share panna mudi illa. No, no, this one. Uh, Anisha, Anisha. Uh, Anisha uh, can you please open the PPT first? Can you please? Ma'am, I opened my PPT, but okay, it is Just not working. I don't know why. That that's fine. Listen, uh, first open the PPT and then now click on the Zoom. And that is you can see the green uh, button share screen. Just click on the share screen. And there are different windows uh, it will show. Click on the, select the PPT window. That's it. It will be shared. You understand what I told? Yes, ma'am. I am sharing, but uh, it is showing your screen is sharing, no. but I don't know why you are not able to see it. I think you have to share with as a window. Okay, fine. Anisha, can There's you an option for uh, window. Your... Yes, ma'am. Hello, Anisha. Can you please uh, send your uh, uh, PPT to the following uh, mail ID? Ma'am, should I leave now again? Uh, can I join? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just you just leave it, then again join. Okay. Hello, Anisha. Hello, ma'am. I am joining with my mobile phone. Actually, I think my PC is not working now. Okay. Because then you do. You, you, yeah, you do one thing. I send that uh, you, my mail ID in the chat box. Now you share your PPT. Then I will share that. No, no issues. So, sir, meanwhile, we will proceed with the next candidate, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Then, uh, you will do that sharing of this yeah, uh, yeah. my mail lady ma okay. okay okay there is some problem in the uh, sharing of uh, first lecture yeah. we will go for the next lecture the next yeah. the next yeah. lecture will I will be on hello yes yeah uh, this the, 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 the title of this talk is highly sensitive behavior of face pure and Texture AG INO2 hexagonal nanoparticle hydrogen <laughs> sensing and the presenter is beta cronina. I am there, sir. Yeah, yeah, you just share now your. Anisha, you stop sharing this. Hello? Uh, Anisha, you just leave the. Yeah, stop leave. share this. Then only her, she need to present her. Anisha? PC is not working. I am trying to stop it, but it is not working. Sorry for the interruption. So you should just switch off your uh, mobile. Not mobile. I am sharing it by my laptop. See, but... Avina, have you tried for sharing this? You try it, whether, whether it is coming. Ma'am, can you stop Already. it? Already I shared, ma'am. Already you shared. Yeah. You are able to see? No, no, I can't able to. The, here you? we are. It is uh, showing Anisha only that. Uh, Anisha, I, I, I am sharing. Because hmm. the high, uh, it, uh, when I started sharing, it asked to uh, stop others to share. That I have given uh, is. But uh, now I have sh started sharing. But it is One minute. Time. Sir, Deva, sir. Deva, sir. One second, sir. 
sir uh, you, we, this candidate I think, uh, you can start the only in when she will leave no, no, that's what this uh, candidate can't able to share another candidate uh, what do we need to do yeah, yeah it is coming pa now yeah. now it is coming yeah yeah veena veena now yes, it is coming you go ahead yeah yeah, uh, yeah. okay ma'am. yeah can i start yeah 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 only 8 minutes okay sir okay thank you uh, good evening all uh, this is beatrice veena uh, i'm a phd scholar from homi baba national institute i'm carrying out my research activities in indira gandhi center for atomic research campus Uh, in this talk, I am going to discuss on highly selective behavior of base pair AgNO2 and uh, textured AgNO2 hexagonal nanoplates for wide range of hydrogen sensing. So, outline of my presentation covers a need for hydrogen sensor and the material selection for this hydrogen sensor application, uh, synthesis of AgNO2, and optimization of parameters uh, using factorial analysis, and its application towards hydrogen sensing. and finally conclusions of this study so need for hydrogen sensor since we all know uh, hydrogen uh, which tagged as uh, next generation fuel of our choice along with this technological importance uh, handling hydrogen with safety consideration is also of uh, foremost importance since uh, this hydrogen gas is uh, colorless and odorless it has a explosive nature and having a flammability range from 4 to 75 percent by volume in air so there are plenty of commercially available chemical sensors uh, which is used to monitor the hydrogen leaks for environmental as well as uh, industrial applications some are listed here so when we adopt these sensors for uh, uh, industrial applications for example in case of nuclear industry some of the drawbacks which we faced are uh, lacking selectivity and short working range chemically unstable and baseline drifts due to humidity effects so we have taken up an objective uh, to look for development of hydrogen sensors which operate in high humidity or interfering gases especially for intended applications so in this regard we have chosen material development for hydrogen sensors is taken up and the, based on the empirical guidelines the sensing material should be chemically stable under operating conditions operate in air under uh, high humidity and selective towards hydrogen and should cover wide concentration range as well as should not suffer uh, cross interference towards any inter uh, hydrocarbons or nox gas therefore more appropriate and selective detection of hydrogen in high humidity with a stable baseline uh, is of major concern so there are uh, binary oxides uh, in progress uh, towards the gas sensing application there are some modifications with dopant additives have taken place we have uh, looked for ternary oxides also so in this regard based on the empirical guidance which i listed earlier uh, we have chosen the delaporcide oxides um, uh, which are of technological importance uh, because we be uh, high p type conductivity and high transparency in cu alo2 was reported in nature by kawazoi then uh, the uh, working on this material has started a quest in the research community so they projected to have applications in various fields some are listed here even though uh, because of uh, even though there are many application point of view the major obstacles with this materials is the synthesis problem so this materials requires higher hydrothermal pressures or higher oxygen pressures uh, to stabilize them in the pure form so the materials the forms under higher pressures or withstands higher pressures uh which has become a natural choice to begin our investigation one such material is silver indium oxide so the table gives uh, the synthesis uh, literature review on the synthesis of this compound until 2019 uh, the material agno2 prepared by various methods the result gives the presence of impurities that is ag and in2o3 along with the agno2 phase so uh, reviewing the literature we have found a crucial step that affecting the synthesis is decomposition of ag2o that is forming ag ag so to avoid this decomposition shannon et al they extremely uh, used externally applied pressure of higher pressure of 3000 bar pressure at 500 degrees celsius using sealed platinum or uh, gold tube method that is uh, solid state reaction at higher pressures uh, higher oxygen pressures 
and chagri ari uh, he used 10 bar pressure brought down pressure to 10 bar and to 10 degree celsius using hydrothermal route in both the conditions they ended up with uh, minor uh, impurity phase of ag and in2o3 uh, and in both the cases they started ag and ag2o and in2o3 as the starting precursors we have brought on some modifications to in the synthesis uh, in that we use hydrothermal method so in the hydrothermal method a minimum solubility of 5 percentage is the uh, required so we have chosen the soluble forms of uh, starting precursors as nitrates and the solubility of hydroxide species of uh, uh, ag and indium are higher than that of oxide species in the aqueous medium so to that we added a KVO solution we got the corresponding hydroxides and to avoid the decomposition of these hydroxide reaction Meena, we can two minutes are left two uh, minutes are left okay the reaction is carried out in the presence of strong base so uh, and to augment the stability of this hydroxide at the processing yeah. temperature go to your results only okay what are the results you got uh, so the material which i prepared uh, uh, the reaction the prepared uh, optimized uh, material optimized material made in the form of a screen printing technique and this is the sensor configuration and the plot shows the temperature as a function of response for hydrogen at different temperatures and the optimum temperature uh, was found at 360 degrees celsius with a response of 6.5 that is the response given as ra by rg resistant in presence of air divided by resistant in presence of a gas so uh, to check its selectivity towards other gases we have chosen few uh, gases lpg nox formaldehyde ammonia and uh, ch4 so these are the potential interfering gases when we look for the intended application in radiolysis of hydrogen uh, water facilities the so pure hydrogen shows high sensitivity towards hydrogen and uh, least response towards uh, uh, liquid petroleum gas representative for hydrocarbons and no response for other gases whereas the uh, compound which has impurities Uh, which lack in selectivity as well as uh, it decreases the uh, sensitivity towards hydrogen also this shows the pure ATNO2 is more selective towards hydrogen and which is of uh, importance towards our uh, application point of view so and the same material was calibrated for a different concentration of hydrogen from 1 ppm and uh, it shows a linear ready up time up time okay. up okay Go to the conclusion. Yeah, just conclude it. So, uh, the uh, AG and IN2 impurity free hexagonal nanoplates of AG and UTO are prepared by hydrothermal route, and the material shows high selectivity and repeatability, having a stable baseline for uh, for AG and UTO for period of six months. And the XPS result shows a decrease in relative fraction of OX minus KVO of the species after exposure to hydrogen. indicates its participation in the hydrogen sensor thank you okay thanks to the speaker if if there is any question from the audience let me i ask one question what is the thickness of your film ah uh, this is sir 20 micron thickness sir 20 micron 20 micron thickness 20 micron okay which which method you are using for to, to, to measure the resistivity uh uh two probe two probe resistivity only two probe is not, a, ah. not 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 good for the uh no actually the resistance is around uh, kilo ohm sir uh, kilo ohm. 100 to it is uh, uh, uh 300 kilo ohm range only so the this uh, We can. Uh, there is no problem with. Uh, any, uh, you are, you are uh, sandwiching your film between two electrodes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Is there, is there any questions? Okay. If there is no question, that is thanks, Bina. Ah, uh, thank you. Sir. Okay. Let us go for the uh, first lecture. That is by Anisha. Anisha is ready. Anisha, are you ready? Anisha, 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 
no sir we okay we can go for the third lecture that is uh, uh, that the title of this third lecture is third presentation is sensitivity of surface potential of pyrene based tetratopic ligand core zinc oxide nano road towards voc and the present and the presenter is and this uh, is presented by surya is surya available is surya is available Hello. Hello, Anisha. Are you ready? Yes, ma'am. I am ready. Okay. Now you will share the screen. No, no, no. Now the lecture is by Anisha. Okay. It it is visible, sir. Yeah. He, no. It is. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. It is visible now. Visible now. You proceed. Okay. You proceed. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, all. Myself, Anisha Bandhavadhai. I am a MTech student of Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. Today's my topic is the electrophoretic deposition of copper oxide nanoleaf for volatile organic compound sensing application. Now, any of uh, gas sensor is um, useful for the indoor, outdoor, and uh, industrial air quality monitoring. And another main reason for the VOC sensor is that it can used as the breath analyzer. now my sensor is the chemi resistive semiconductor metal oxide type sensor and uh, what is the gas sensing mechanism behind the chemi resistive mm -hmm. smo type sensor is that the uh, it, it is the sensing layer uh, and uh, this is the sensing material our sensing material is the p type copper oxide now when this sensing material is exposed to the air then oxygen adsorption is taking place on the sensor surface and after the uh, oxygen adsorption the resistance mm -hmm. of the resistance of the uh, semiconductor is changes and if in the resistance of the semiconductor in presence of air is uh, ra then in this is the ra and upon the exposure of the uh, test gas in our case the test gas is the voc that is volatile organic compound and they are reducing in nature they also adsorb on the sensing surface and after that there there is a reaction between the adsorb oxygen and the adsorb voc and uh, a product ro is formed now as voc is reducing in nature they are giving up electron uh, on the uh, conduction band of the semiconductor and as the uh, semiconductor is p type copper oxide semiconductor so upon increasing the electron concentration the resistance of that uh, resistance of that semiconductor increases and this is denoted as rg now how much the resistance will change this will depend upon the nature of the gas we have used now in our case the gas is the voc that is uh, volatile organic compound now the whether the adsorption is fizzy adsorption or the chemi adsorption this depends on the temperature of the system and the temperature of the uh, this is a gas sensing setup by using with we have measured this resistance change and this uh, temperature can be controlled by the temperature controller now uh, uh, copper oxide the p type copper oxide is prepared by simple weight chemical method the weight chemical uh, in weight chemical method this is ppr because this is a very easier method and this is very cost effective now in this method copper nitrate uh, uh, sodium hydroxide and ammonium oxide are mixed together and after stirring copper oxide uh, particles are precipitated and after washing you can collect the precipitate now we have done the xrt analysis for this copper oxide and we get that a pure 
more monoclinic phase is formed in case of the copper oxide. Now, by using this prepared copper oxide, we have made two types of sensor. One is pellet, uh, copper oxide pellet, and another is copper oxide uh, thick film. This thick film deposition is done by electrophoretic deposition technique, and this thick film is deposited on a non-conducting alumina substrate. Our motive is to analyze this, wh what is the change of the sensing characteristic by changing the uh, thickness of the sensing material that is from the pellet to thick film. Now this is the this is the SEM image of the EPD grown uh, thick film, and you can see that the particles are uniformly distributed in this case, and they are porous. This will help us for the sensing behavior. Now before the result and discussion, I like to familiar some terms. That is, S S is the response percent. Response percent is the change in resistance divided by resistance in air. Response time the time required for reaching R A to R G, and recovery time is the time required uh, for the uh, reaching RG to again RA. The optimum temperature is the temperature at which the sensor is showing maximum response. And the stability is in term of the baseline resistance stability that is after several cycles. If the baseline uh, resistance after several cycles, if there is a marginal baseline resistance dip, then you can say that the sensor is having a good baseline resistance. Now, in our case, the result is that the copy, these the, are the two con resistance transient of the two type of sensor, that is copper oxide pellet and copper oxide thick cream. Now, in case in both two cases, two sensors are showing the same response percent, but there is difference in terms of the response time and recovery time. The response time and recovery time is lower in case of the copper oxide thick film than that of the copper oxide pellet. So in, and in terms of the baseline stability, you can see that in this resistant transient, the, there is a considerable change in the baseline. But in this copper oxide thick film, you can see that there is a marginal drift occur in the copper oxide thick film. So you can say that copper oxide thick film is, uh, is good based, is having very good baseline stability compared to the copper oxide pellet. Now we have done S versus T simulation for uh, knowing theoretically what is the optimum temperature. And this simulation is done by Anisha, using two minutes Okay, ma'am. And this simulation is done by using this equation. And uh, the, uh, after the simulation, you can get different parameters out of them. The EA and EK are very important. They are the activation energy. Now activation EA is the activation energy for the transaction and EK is the activation energy for the first order kinetics. First order kinetics means if A denotes the oxygen and B denotes the test gas when they are adsorbed on the sensor surface, a reaction between them occur. And this reaction is the first order reaction. And what is the activation energy of the first, uh, this first order reaction? This can be evaluated by, using, by simulating S and T by using this equation. Now, in our case, we got that uh, theoretically that copper oxide pellet, pellet having uh, optimum temperature at 272 degrees Celsius and thick cream has been 350 degrees Celsius. In terms of the uh, activation energy, that is the first order kinetics, both two sensors having same activation energy of first order kinetics, but in terms of the uh, in activation energy of transaction, the copper oxide thick cream having lower activation energy than the pellet. This uh, relates our result occurred in experimentally. That is the uh, thick film uh, which sensor having lower activation energy. This will show the first response. So thick film having lower activation energy and it, it is showing the first response compared to the pellet. So I can conclude by saying that the copper oxide thick film sensor is more efficient in terms of the response time, response recovery time, and the baseline stability. And in future, we can do conduct and transient analysis for knowing what is the underlying mechanism behind this sensing characteristic. These are the references I have used. I am thankful uh, to SRM Institute for organizing such a uh, con conference. I am thankful to IIT Kharagpur. I am thankful to Professor Subhasis Basu Majumdar, who is my supervisor. I, I, I am thankful to he, my head, faculty staff members, my project members, Kamalika Mundal, Vibhav Amitkar, and Dr. Devasis Das, and I am thankful to my friends and family. Thank you. That's all from my side. So, thank you, Anisha. Now the session is open for discussion. Yeah. Yes, yes.
Is there any question from the audience? Anisha, I have one question. Yes. One question that is, uh, what is the distance between two electrodes while you are depositing by electrophoric method? Actually, in electrophoric method, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, in electrophoric deposition technique, actually, uh, we are mixing. Uh, what, 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 is the, what is the spacing between two electrodes? And how much voltage you are applying? Sir, how much voltage? Sir, yeah. I can't say, say that how much voltage now. Yeah, how much voltage you have applied during your experiment? Have you done this experiment or not? Yes, sir. I am done part of this experiment. Actually, this is the teamwork and I am presenting it. And I have done, but um, I really forgot what is the actual value of this voltage. So you have to mention it, okay? Because yes, this is sir. important because uh, this uh, voltage applied or the spacing between two electrodes is also a uh, very important parameter to deposit the films. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. For the thickness of the film, yeah, it yeah. is very important. But sorry, sir, I really oh, yeah. forgot the exact value. Okay. Is there any, any other questions? Anisha, I have one question. What is your thickness of your film? Can you able to tell? Yes, ma'am. This is uh, almost uh, two micron. Two micron. Yes. Mm. Okay. If there is no question, let us thanks Anisha again, once again, for a nice presentation. Thank you, sir. And the, now the last one is by Surya. Is Surya available? Surya is available for presentation? Hello? Surya is not available, sir. Surya? I think the person yeah. is not available, available, sir. Yeah. Not available? Present. Not, not available, present. sir. Okay. Not present. Okay. Then I, we have to close the session. I thank yes, for all the speakers, particularly Roberto and uh, Anisa and the Bina, Bina. Very nice presentation. Thank you very much. So I conclude this section. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, invited speakers, Roboto and uh, that uh, uh, contributory lectures uh, that uh, students Anisha and Veena. I thankful once again to that uh, chairperson, so Ganesh Datta uh, Sharma sir. So thank you one and all, and have a pleasant stay with us, sir. Thank you, thank you one okay, and thank all. You thank you so much. Thank you very much. So I guess we come directly to the next session, uh, session 5B, with uh, only three minutes delay. Um, my name is Wolfgang Kuch. I'm from Freie Universität Berlin, Germany, and I will chair the session. And let me begin by introducing the first speaker. I should share this. It is uh, Professor Corrado Di Natale uh, from Italy, from the University of Roma Torvagata, uh, Department of Electronic Engineering. And uh, Professor Di Natale is an expert in the development and application of chemical, biosensors, and artificial sensorial systems. And um, he involves also the application of machine learning algorithms uh, to the development of chemical sensors. And um, Professor Di Natale will present uh, his uh, research in a talk with the title Organic, Inorganic, Nanostructured Hybrid Materials uh, for Gas Sensors. So I'm very happy and curious to hear your talk. Uh, please, the stage is yours. I stop my sharing and then you should be able to share your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning or good evening. And I'm going to share my screen. Can you, you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Okay, thanks uh, for the nice introduction and thanks for the to the organizer for inviting me to talk about, about uh, let's say some of the work we are doing here at the at the census group at the University of Rome Tor Bergata. Well, today I talk about uh, let's say a, a research line that we uh, opened a few years ago about uh, the preparation of uh, hybrid materials that can exploit the properties of sensitive materials such as porphyrins in order to prepare chemoresistive sensors. And we see, uh, I will, let's say, try to tell you what we did uh, in this uh, research. Okay, let me start with a, a, a definition. So probably it's not necessary, but just let's say to frame the discussion. So what a gas sensor is, a gas sensor is a device, is actually something like an electronic devices because it can be connected to a circuit and the parameter of this device depends on the concentration of some, of some chemicals that are in the environment and that interacts with the sensor itself. How this is done? This is done typically in a double deck structure. We have a sort of a sensitive material uh, and this material interacts uh, with the molecules from the, from the envi uh, environment. And as a consequence of the interaction, some physical property of the material changes. And what we are going to measure actually is this physical property. This property can be the conductivity or can be the, the mass or the optical uh, uh, the absorption or whatever else. So at the end, we need, let's say, two components the sensitive material and a device, a tr transducer that can detect the change of the physical quantity affected by the interaction and convert this into an electric signal. And then we have the electronic circuit where this sensor is alive and where we can, let's say, appreciate their, their signals. So there are a, a, a very large number of possibilities to assemble sensors because uh, sensitive materials are countless. So we can just uh, use uh, as materials, uh, uh, inorganic uh, materials uh, such as metal oxides, which are very popular to prepare gas sensors or uh, even carbon-based material, uh, carbon nanostructure-based material, carbon nanotubes, graphene is, uh, let's say, uh, very widely used for these purposes. But we have also organic materials. So those that are prepared from uh, bioorganic chemistry and uh, these materials, let's say, are at the boundary with, uh, with the biology because uh, even, let's say, biomolecules are in some sense organic, uh, organic uh, molecules. And then we have, in this case, a very large number of possibility to assemble molecules and to, and to let's say, confer uh, chemical uh, uh, sensitivity to these molecules. But even if, uh, let's say, with the organic, uh, with the inorganic material, such as metal oxide semiconductors or carbon nan nanotubes, the, the preparation of sensor is quite straightforward because these materials are typically conductive. So we can make a very simple chemical re resistors out of that. In case of organic uh, materials, uh, this, uh, let's say, feasibility to make sensor is not so common, is not so simple because typically these materials are not conductive and then we need additional strategies to measure, to measure the response of these uh, materials to the environmental molecules. So in uh, my group uh, with my colleagues, uh, we are just studying the, um, the properties, the chemical sensitivity properties of this class of molecules, porphyrins or, and porphyrinoids, let's say porphyrins are the most uh, eminent uh, member of a larger family of molecules, which are called porphyrinoids, which are characterized by uh, an extended uh, uh, aromatic, uh, aromatic ring that can be further decorated. Porphyrins in particular are quite interesting because uh, we can just observe porphyrin in nature. And we know that in nature, porphyrins play very important, uh, let's say, uh, functions. For instance, the conversion of light into energy in, by the chlorophyll or the transport of oxygen in blood. So they have at the same time optical properties and even, let's say, 
adsorption pro properties because porphyrin absorbs, adsorbs, let's say, oxygen, release oxygen. They absorb also other molecules and so on. So porphyrins are, are uh, let's say, a very interesting for a technological exploitation. So we find them in many, let's say, different uh, uh, technological realms, uh, not least, let's say, as element of molecular electronics or even in solar cells. And we'll say something about the, how solar cells inspired part of this uh, research. And uh, in terms of, let's say, of sensors, porphyrins are just one of those, sen those molecules for which uh, is not so simple to get a, a, a sensor because they are, not, are, are quite barely conductive. So it's not very nice to get a, a resistor. It's not very conductive, a resistor made of porphyrins. So we followed in the past different stra strategies to prepare sensors. And uh, one of the most efficient uh, for us has been, let's say, to measure the change of mass in porphyrins layers. So this can be done very, uh, let's say, uh, simply with a, a device called the quartz microbalance. This is, let's say, um, let's see if I can use a, a pointer, uh, laser pointer. Okay, this is, let's say, a, a, a quartz crystal. So it's a piezoelectric material. So the resonance, the mechanical resonance frequency, uh, the mechanical resonance oscillations of this uh, crystal is associated to the LED to an electronic uh, uh, oscillation. So it is an electronic uh, resonator. And the resonant fre frequency uh, depends on the mass that is gravitating onto the surface of the crystal. So the, it's easy to convert this crystal into a sensor because it is, uh, can be coated with, uh, for instance, a porphyrin layer. And this green hue you see here is just the color of the porphyrin quartz, otherwise quartz is transparent. And when the porphyry layer absorbs molecules, it changes the mass, change frequency, and then with this can be can be can be measured. So, what kind of sensor is a, por a, a, a porphyry is? Is a non-selective sensor. So, means that there are a number of contemporaneous uh, uh, interaction that can take place onto a porphyry. A porphyry can, uh, let's say, interact with airborne molecules because of hydrogen bond or because of aromatic interaction. When there is a metal, and usually there is a metal at the center of the porphyrinic ring, uh, let's say there is a, a further interaction coordination with the, of the volatile molecules with this metal. So the porphyrin can be, can be seen as a multiple deck with multiple interactions can take place. We can, at a synthetic level, to change the balance between this interaction, but it's quite difficult to make one totally predominant respect to the other. So we do not expect selectivity from porphyrins. And actually, if you look here, this is the response of the sensor versus concentration. And each symbol states for a different volatile compound. And you see that the, the single sensor is sensitive to many different to many different compounds. But what happened? It happens that the, the, the single sensor is not selected, but when we take an array of sensors, so when we make an ensemble of sensors, and we, instead of considering the signal of a single sensor, we consider the multi-component, the multivariate signal made by the responses of all the sensors in the array, we got selectivity. So this is a very typical, uh, let's say, way of showing data in multi-component, uh, uh, multi-dimensional data. This is a principal component analysis plot. And we see that in this principal component planes, which is contributed by total sensor of the array, the different uh, compound can be easily, let's say, separated and, uh, and identified. But which, uh, what we need to do this? We need, uh, let, let's say, sensors made of porphyrins, but it is important that these sensors are different one each other. So the balance between interaction that I mentioned before has to be different for each sensor. In this way, each sensor contributes differently to the total, uh, to, the, to the multivariate signal. And then this can be, let's say, used to, uh, identify, to identify compounds. And these, uh, um, sorry, but my computer, okay. No. 
I'm sorry, there is, a, I got a problem with my computer. We try to stop the sharing and then start again. The presentation frozen, sorry. <laughs> I never okay. had before, so it's... Um, I, I stopped yeah. the, the you, sharing yeah. for you. Maybe then it unfreezes, hopefully. Um, I'll just share my and then stop this again. <clears throat> So you anyway? Yes. So now, now try to, if you can, restart the sh uh, screen sharing. Yes, I I continue to see. I I, I just to stop uh, the connection for uh, for a minute. Oh, sorry. I, um, what's happening? Just a minute. Zoom frozen. Mm -hmm. to resume. Mm -hmm. frozen. I need to re to restart. Uh, I'm sorry. still connected I think he's, he's starting okay because I can still see his name in the list disappeared yeah for all those who connected later we are in the middle of the invited talk but there was a technical problem so we hope to continue in one or two minutes yeah So how, how do we proceed in such a case? We just uh, delay the rest of the session or? Uh, one, uh, one minute, sir. Uh, back to the overheads. Back to the overheads. Um, how we should proceed, whether we should uh, delay the other talks in the session or whether we should try to shorten the talk to keep more or less in time. One, one minute, sir. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, shall we go to the contributed lecture? Uh, let him connect, yeah. and we can we can uh, yeah, continue. Yeah, that, that's one possibility. Let's see. No, no. I the... think he's joining. He's joining. I think. Ah, styling now. Okay, then let's yeah. wait. Yeah. Ah, okay. Back to your rights. Yeah.
Yeah, I think now he's. Uh... Okay. Then let's let's try again. <laughs> Uh, your microphone is still uh, muted. Professor Corrado, uh, microphone is muted. Uh, okay. okay, it's working. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Good. yeah, yeah. Then let's continue. I'm so sorry. I, uh, okay. It seems that host disabled attendee screen sharing. <laughs> I see a message uh, say that I can't uh, share my screen. Yeah, now you can share, sir. Okay. Okay, I'm very sorry. Can you can you hear me now? Can you see? Okay. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Yes. I would think that uh, this is, uh, let's say, the uh, what we call here, what we have seen here, is what we call electronic noise, basically. So this is the the same way, or the same principle, let's say, of uh, function of uh, behaving of uh, olfactory neurons and olfaction. So when, every time we have an array of sensors which are non-selective but sufficiently different to one each other. This is what we call uh, electronic noise. And uh, in the past, uh, we just uh, developed uh, sensors uh, with these uh, quartz micro porphyrins coated uh, quartz microbalances, and they have been used, uh, uh, let's say, in different kind of uh, applications. For instance, uh, for uh, food quality and control, or for medical di diagnosis. They work very well. Let's say, for instance, in diagnosis diseases from the evaluation of the volatile of the volatile compounds. So this is basically what we did in in uh, in terms of porphyrins ex exploitation and uh, just with the quartz micro microbalance. Anyway, there is some let's say not not problem, but I'd say drawback with these sensors because they are quite costly because the quartz crystal is not exactly let's say. Um, cheap and uh, we do not produce this uh, this course they, we have to buy them in the market the sensor is bulky and so on so it would be very good let's say to move these features onto more simple more simple uh, 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 re resistors and uh, uh, this is uh, let's say a, a, um, a trend in the research so how to make conductive sensors with non-conductive uh, materials. And there are, let's say, a number of, uh, of uh, uh, so solutions, for instance, to use, uh, uh, to use uh, let's say, uh, uh, quartz, uh, carbon nanotubes or silicon na na nanowires. In this case, let's say the absorption of charged or dipolar molecules can affect the conductance in the nanotube or in the nanowire or even let, let's say to use uh, uh, this is a very nice uh, a very uh, let's say uh, um, interesting uh, uh, idea just to the de de disperse polymers which are not conductive into a carbon black uh, substrate matrix and the absorption into polymer swells the the, the material the carbon black grains uh, change the interdistance and change the, con the conductivity. Another very interesting approach is to use, uh, let's say, coated uh, um, metal nanoparticles. So in this case, the sensitive mat materials coats the surface of metal nanoparticles. And when there is absorption, these absorbed mo molecules stay between the two, two adjacent uh, particles and they interfere, so let's say, with the current flowing between particles. This current, in particular, if the, the distance is very short, and it is because it is the size of, mo of molecules, there is, a, let's say, a tunneling current, which is extremely sensitive to the distance. And it is also sensitive if there is, a, let's say, some additional electrostatic field in between. So these sensors are very, 
let's say, interesting, and they are very, let's say, uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, example how to turn, let's say, a non sensitive, a non conductive material into a conductive sense. In case of porphyrins, porphyrins are very keen, let's say, to. Uh, to be, let's say, used in combination with other materials, just because they have a very strong interaction. So this interaction is exploited to make sensors for the gas phase, but it can also be exploited, let's say, to make, to, to combine, to make, to, let's say, make the porphyry interacting with other, with other materials. And in the past, we just exploited this, uh, this approach, making chemo re resistors. These are examples with, uh, let's say, incorporation of porphyrins into tin oxide. And in this case, we observed that the presence of porphyrins favors the sensitivity of the, of the tin oxide. And we get a working sensors at the very low, uh, at the lowest, at the lower temperature respect to the usual temperature at which uh, tin oxide works. But uh, more interesting, uh, we can use, let's say, porphyrins to coat the carbon nanotubes. And in this case, we have sensors working at room temperature. And we see that the addition of porphyrins, here we may see the response uh, of sensor uh, pure carbon na na nanotube, a nanotube coated with two different uh, porphyrins. And we see that how the response is strongly, let's say, increased by the presence of porphyrin. The porphyrins drive the sensitivity of the, of the carbon nanotube. The carbon na nanotube, let's say, acts, let's say, in this case, as a tra 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 transducer. So this is a viable way to prepare, let's say, conductive sensor using and exploiting the sensitivity of porphyrin. But nonetheless, uh, what we have been very interested was, uh, let's say, the, uh, um, this fact, the fact that porphyrins are important elements in a disensitized solar cells. In a disensitized solar, solar cell, the porphyrin uh, or is, uh, let's say, the light uh, sensitizer. So is the molecule that absorb light and porphyrins are known for their very uh, strong absorption of, li of, of light. The absorption of light promotes electrons in the in excited molecular orbitals. And from these molecular orbitals, they can be uh, transferred into the conductance bands of large band gap semiconductor. This is the starting point to make a, a circuit where this electron can run, let's say, into, let's say, an external uh, load and then for instance light up a lamp on or and so on so this is the the porphyrin so let's say the the use of the optical the photonic properties of porphyrin so we have been interested to this fact and we asked ourselves if this phenomena can also interfere with the gas sensitivity i mean when the porphyrin is under light we have that the electronic charge in porphyrin is uh, let's say in an excited state and, uh, and when these charges are are extracted from from the porphyrin and delivered to the metal oxide uh, we have additional free molecular orbitals that can be occupied by electrons uh, from airborne molecules and then uh, this is let's say the principle that that we just uh, tried uh, to exploit so we have porphyrins onto zinc oxide and when the porphyrin the the electron let's say porphyrins can receive electrons from donor molecule for instance and mines these electrons let's say can be through the light by the light, let's say, injected into the conduction band of, met of semiconductor. And then we can observe the absorption of molecule as a change of uh, conductivity. This has been exploited uh, some years ago, let's say um, by uh, um, Yuvaraj Shivalingam when he was uh, here in Rome. And uh, let's say uh, uh, the idea was very simple. Let's make a forest of nanorods metal ox of zinc oxide nanorods. Let's go to these nanorods with the porphyrins and see what happens. And see what happens uh, is the following fact. The first thing is that we got a photoconductive uh, system, a photoconductive uh, uh, photoresistor, because this is, let's say, the absorption light, the, the 
from uh, the combination of zinc and porphyrin, porphyrin absorbed in the visible light. When a white LED is used to illuminate the uh, device, what we get, let's say, is uh, an, uh, just a, a visible current, so something that we can measure. But what was more interesting for us is to observe how this current is affected by the absorption of, of gas. And what we found is that there is a very large, uh, sensitive, uh, very, uh, uh, let's say, high sensitivity to donor molecules. Again, as we said before, the, for instance, the exposure to triethylamine, just because triethylamine donates electron to the, to the porphyrin, these electron through the light are delivered onto the metal oxide, and then we can get them in an external circuit. So in this plot here, we see the response, the, re the resistance change versus concentration for triethylamine under light porphyrin coated zinc oxide. This is not uh, visible, at, for instance, with ethanol, because uh, in ethanol, the transfer of electron is a very, is a much less uh, efficient respect to triethylamine. So this was the first step in this direction. The second step was just about how to prepare these materials. So the very, uh, let's say, straightforward uh, word procedure is to make the nanostructure and then to coat with the, let's say, uh, standard dipping coating with the porphyrins, but we can also do something else. So we can add the porphyrin into this, the, the, uh, into the precursor sol solution. These, uh, the, these nanostructure were made by hydrothermal growth. And uh, porphyrin then assists the growth of the nanostructure and they just have a contrib contribute to the creation of the nanostructure. Okay. Uh, three minutes. What? Three, three more minutes. Okay, you are counting the interruption. Okay. Uh, I, they, I was just asked by the organizers. To... <laughs> no, we can, but uh, yeah, maybe okay. five. <clears throat> are you counting the, in the interaction? Okay, it's okay. I, I go ahead until I go and then I stop. <laughs> so I don't want to interrupt the, the uh, you know, to change the chapter ab ab abruptly. Anyway, what we got here is that the presence of porphyrin changes the, the morphology. This morphology is important because even if this device, these uh, materials are made of the same stuff, porphyrin and nano and zinc oxide, their sensitivity is, di is different. And so we can make an, a sensor array made by, by the same material, but prepared in a different way. This is, let's say, a, a, a demonstration of that obtained measuring the surface, uh, uh, the surface potential with the Kelvin probe. But uh, with this can be done more efficiently with the nanoparticles because nanorods needs a surface to grow, but nanoparticle, let's say, can be growth and then collected and then deposited onto sensors. And this is just, let's say, uh, one pot prepared sensors made, let's say, with two kinds of porphyrinoids, porphyrins and corals. And uh, here what we get. So when we expose them to a number of different compounds, we see re re response to all of them. But if you look carefully, you see that in a couple of cases, triethylamine, triethylphosphite, so two molecules very similar, nitrogen, phosphorus here. What you get uh, is that the, the change of uh, conductivity goes uh, in, the, in the opposite direction. In, then, in all cases, the conductivity, the, the, res the resistance increases. In this case, the resistance decreases. So this is a very important because it gives us non-selectivity, okay, still unselective, but at the same time, we have a strong identification of donor compounds. So this is what we get, let's say, with the principal component analysis, with the, the array made with the four sensors, two porphyrin, two corol, one porphyrin and one corol without metal, one porphyrin and one corol with a copper metal. And so uh, uh, at the end, we are going, uh, let's say, in the in the right direction because we can get, let's say, sensors, resistive sensors, exploiting the properties of porphyrins, but with additional features because we are become we we, we became very sensitive 
to donor molecules. And this can be, I, I show you this as, a, as the final one. So I don't want to over, I think I, the three minutes uh, elapsed. And uh, I just to show you that what we can get is just to have maps of different compounds. Uh, here you may see triethylamine, triethylphosphate, butylamine, ethanol, water, and so on. But this is also an atlas, a sort of an atlas, because I can project onto this plane signals from much more complex uh, sources. For instance, as in this case, we have meat and wine. And this is, uh, these are, let's say, the signals from spoiling meat. This is our loaves and these are grinded meat. And then we see that they move in time towards a mines. And this is what we actually expect because this is the process of spoilage of meat. And in this little square, what we, got, we, we, we get are wine. And wine is exactly between alcohol and water where we do expect them. So we have just gone to the direction to prepare uh, something, some artificial olfaction system quite, uh, um, let's say, uh, very interesting because it can uh, detect uh, different things. Now I show here, let's say, uh, food, but it can be applied also to medical, as I said before. And uh, we can use uh, these uh, atlases in order to orient ourselves into a chemical space. And this is very similar to what we find in olfaction, where we have this projection onto the olfactory bulb and different compounds projects into the, the olfactory bulb in areas which are related to their chemistry. So we find, let's say, this is an image of the projection into the mouse uh, olfactory, olfactory bulb. And uh, if we look uh, in more details, for instance, we go to emphasize, to magnify the, the data in this uh, little square. Wines are very similar one each other, but when we go into the detail, we see that white and red are different. And then we can detect, let's say, the differences uh, between them in this plot. So I just uh, skip this part, but it is uh, it's another. And uh, I just can say that my conclusions so the conclusion is that we have a very nice molecule to make sensor arrays. This molecule is not conductive. We can turn it into a conductive sensor using, let's say, combination with a wide band gap metal, metal oxide semi, semiconductors. And light is, is the end, is the, just the, the, the tool that makes this happening. And uh, I really um, apologize for the, for the technical problems. Uh, and I thank all of you. I thank you for your uh, attention and your kindness. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> OK, um, yeah, we have time for questions. Uh, questions from the audience, I think you can raise the Zoom hand, or if this doesn't work in your case, then just speak up. Uh, if nobody immediately ans uh, asks something, I could ask a question. I think when you first explained this with the selectivity and the array that was close to the technical problems, that was the porphyrins on the quartz microbalance. And uh, you had this plot with the array. And for me, as a non-specialist in the sensors, um, I could not uh, capture what was plotted, this um, principal component one and two. Maybe you could quickly explain yeah, how sure. the selectivity works. Yes, um, I think again, the, oh, sorry. You mentioned this one, is it? Yes, yes. Okay, here you have just the response of a single sensor. When you arrange the sensor responses into a plot, usually we consider each axis, you know, we, we build a vector space and each axis of this vector space is, let's say, uh, 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 contains the response of, of, uh, of uh, one different sensor. Up to three sensors, we can visualize that, okay? But as the number is greater than three, this is no more possible. Principal component analysis uh, is uh, what we see here in the right, in the right side is a simple projection method from a high dimensional space onto 
in this case, onto a plane, onto a bidimensional space. This projection is driven by the maximum um, variance. So which is the projection where the data are displayed, let's say, much wider, you know? Okay. It's yeah. a, in this, when we do, we do this, we observe that the signals related to different compounds just a, a, a cluster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so array, array of sensors means different sensors, right? Yes. And they are read separately. Exactly. Ah, yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay I understand. As a, the, the mathematical equivalent is a system of equations of, of yeah. both Okay. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah. One more participant uh, asking question. Uh, Kishore? Uh, Kishore? Can you unmute and ask? Yeah. Hello, Professor. Yes. Yeah, Professor, I have a question. How to select an appropriate porphyrin for a particular metal oxide? Sorry, can you... I, can you repeat, please? How to select appropriate porphyrins for particular metal oxides? Okay, uh, there has not been, let's say, a proper selection of the porphyrin. We just uh, used the, the same porphyrin that we are using with the course of micro, micro balance. What we did was to functionalize the porphyrin in order to make more easy the interaction, the, the connection with the, with the, with the metal with the metal oxide. Here, for instance, you see there is a, car a, car a carboxyl group, which is, uh, is known, again, from uh, disensitized solar cell, that this group, let's say, favor the binding of porphyrin onto the zinc, the, the zinc oxide. So what we did was just to take the same sense, the same molecules that have been used with the quartz microbalance and just with this uh, further functionalization, it does not affect the chemical sensitivity. Use that, use them with the with the zinc oxide to bind them onto the surface of uh, zinc oxide. Just because we were interested, let's say, to see if the the sensitivity was uh, retained or not by the chemo resistor. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions from the audience? No, seems not to be the case. Then, yeah, thank you very much again for the talk. Thank you. Sorry again for the problems. Uh, yeah, no problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, we will continue with the contributed yeah. talks. And the first one is uh, by Gokul Selvaraj about bismuth layer thin films for chemical resistive NO2 gas sensor applications. Please. His name is not available. Ah, he's not available? The participant list. Is he available? Gokul Selvaraj? I think he's not available, sir. We can go to the next talk. We go to the next talk. Okay. Yeah. The, the next talk would be by. Rajesh Unutpadi about P cobalt 304 supported carbon nanofibers based heterojunction nanostructures for ammonia gas sensor applications. Is uh, Rajesh there? Rajesh? Ah, yes, sir. Yes, ah, okay. yes sir. Then please uh, share your screen. Okay, okay, sure. Please take eight minutes. Okay. Rajesh, you can take eight minutes for presentation. Uh, okay. Two minutes discussion. Okay, sure. Okay. Please go ahead. Is my slide out visible, sir? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, okay. Can I start? Yes. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Today, I'm going to discuss about P-type cobalt oxide supported carbon nanofibers based heterojunction nanostructures for ammonia gas sensor applications. Myself, Rajesh Yupi, 
doing uh, research under the guidance of Dr. P. B. G. Associate Professor, PhD Institute of Advanced Studies, Coimbatore. Why we need ammonia gas sensor? Ammonia is a toxic gas that present in the environment, which can cause serious uh, health issues in our human life system, which can cause head fatigue, respiratory illness, cardiovascular illness, gastrogenous effect, cancer risk, nausea, and skin irritation in our day-to-day -day, uh, life. From this, ammonia has found a serious biomarker in this field for sensing ammonia gas, sensing, uh, gas in our uh, body. The ammonia can lead serious health issues in our day-to-day uh, -day life, which can liver diseases, chronic kidney diseases, and also it can affect as a dehydration effect in human body. To sensitize um, uh, to sense ammonia, we can have several challenges to sense this kind of ammonia, which can include low cost sensor system followed by quantitative method and also to report the lower detection limit uh, it's around 50 ppb and to selective detection for ammonia and no interference from temperature and humidity. So here are my objective. The major objective of this work is to develop metal oxide based the major ob objective of this work is to develop metal oxide based p type cobalt oxide functionalizer with a carbon nanofiber heterojunction nanocomposite and its quantitative estimation of ammonia gas sensing applications and to develop co uh, p type cobalt oxide carbon nanofiber heterojunction nanofiber for ammonia sensor to study the ammonia gas sensing properties and in investigation of the influence of environmental parameters of the sensor followed by establish uh, to establish the correlation between gas or the gas metal interaction with the sensing mechanism. These are the methodology that I have carried out for fabricating the P type cobalt oxide supported carbon nanofibers. First, I have synthesized the pure P type cobalt oxide nanoparticles by using one, per, uh, one weight percentage of cobalt nitrate followed by adding 0 0.5 is to 4 ratio of potassium nitrate and the acetic acid. And then after uh, adding the uh, sodium uh, hydroxide to molar is added dropwise to the above solution and then kept autoclave for 180 degrees Celsius for 12 hours and then washed with 800 degree Celsius. So, uh, this is the synthesis method for uh, P type of cobalt oxide nanoparticles. For synthesizing the carbon nanofibers, we had carried out an electro spinning method. In this method, uh, this is the most common usually method for synthesizing uh, carbon nanofiber. Uh, the polyacrylate nitride nanofiber is used, is used for the synthesis of carbon nanofiber with uh, followed by carbonization process around 270 degrees Celsius for two hours. In this method, the 800 degrees Celsius for one hour at a nitrogen uh, in the presence of nitrogen atmosphere is carried out for synthesizing the carbon nanofiber. And we have and I have successfully uh, synthesized carbon nanofiber by using electro spinning method. And after that, uh, for synthesizing P type of cobalt oxide functionalized with, uh, functionalized with the carbon nanofiber, ultrasonication is, has been done by using uh, ethanol as a solvent medium for 50 minutes uh, by using ultrasonication. And after drying, we have, uh, I have reported that uh, uh, the carbon nanofibers are uh, formed and, uh, at, uh, and along with the cobalt oxide attached along with uh, the carbon nanofibers. The structural, and, uh, structural analysis are being carried out by, by using XRD and Raman spectra. From the XRD spectra, I have carried out uh, uh, the pure cobalt oxide and carbon nanofiber and also the carbon nano uh, cobalt oxide CNF uh, XRD measurements have been taken. From this uh, XRD spectra, the 220 and 311 and 400 uh, uh, zero and 440 planes are present and confirm cu uh, cubic structure of cobalt oxide according to, according to the JCPDS card number. This uh, cobalt, uh, this uh, cobalt, uh, pure cobalt oxide XRD spectra is very well matched with the synthesized uh, cobalt oxide CNF uh, material. Uh, uh, cobalt oxide material, which can be uh, view, uh, which can be seen from uh, uh, in here. 
and then after that i have gone through uh, raman spectra to confirm the presence of uh, carbon nanofiber that is the d and g band which is the more d and g band which is the uh, carbon uh, most active peak of ra carbon material that is uh, 1380 uh, and uh, 1580 of carbon materials for same the cobalt oxide nanoparticles present at 464 508 and 602 and 6 69 centimeter inverse correspond to cobalt oxide, which correspond to EG, F2G, and F2, F2G, and the A1G modes of cobalt oxide. And then the carbon nanofibers uh, are observed at the uh, 1300 and 1500. That is the defective and the graphitic nature of carbon nanofibers. For the synthesized uh, cobalt oxide uh, carbon nanofibers, the yes. both uh, spectral minutes. <clears throat> No, no, please, please continue. Two more minutes. <laughs> okay, okay. Have been uh, reported. These are the morphologic analysis of uh, uh, the synthesized carbon nanofiber functionalized with the carbon uh, cobalt oxide. Here, the uh, same images correspond to the pure cobalt oxide and uh, the um, uh, and co uh, pure cobalt oxide. And this is the the uh, image should be uh, represents the carbon nanofiber. And see very well confirms the presence of both the carbon nanofiber attached uh, carbon nanofiber. Uh, the cobalt oxide is attached on the carbon nanofibers, which can be seen clearly from these same images. To confirm more the presence of carbon nanofibers attached on the cobalt oxide, it axis has been uh, taken. Which uh, the edax, uh, which uh, edax has been taken. This is the carbon nanofiber formed in the semi image, and this is the oxygen, and this means the cobalt. And the elemental mapping has been done. And from this elemental mapping, the atomic weight percentage of corresponding carbon is 24.13 percentage, and oxygen for 32.29 percentage, and cobalt for 43.58 percentage. And after that, the ammonia sensing properties of uh, ammonia sensing properties have been carried out. Uh, uh, harmony sensing properties have been ca uh, carried out. Uh, in this uh, work, uh, we had uh, applied uh, ammonia gas sensor uh, with a different concentration uh, like 1 ppm, 2 ppm, 3 ppm, up to 5 ppm. And the uh, successful uh, resistivity have been increased because of the uh, cobalt oxide is a p-type material and uh, uh, carbon nanofiber is a conductive material. So both of the combination of uh, both of this combination, which we, uh, we have observed that there is an increase in the res uh, resistivity, resistivity, and uh, this is the linear plot of the cobalt oxide, pure that is Bayer cobalt oxide, which shows the linear graph that is linearity in the um, sensing, linearity in the sensing of ammonia, sensing of ammonia, and after that uh, we had carried out the same. For cobalt, the, um, the synthesizer cobalt oxide CNF uh, materials, which can uh, uh, which can carry out a zero to five ppm concentration by uh, uh, five pm five ppm concentration of ammonia, which also shows the increase in resistivity by applying ammonia at a certain ppm level, and also the linearity shows the uh, at the increase in resistivity the concentration of ammonia is also increasing up to five ppm. And this so, uh, shows the recovery and response time for ammonia gas sensing material for Bayer cobalt oxide and uh, synthesized cobalt oxide based carbon nanofiber. Here, the decrease in responsibility has been observed for uh, synthesized carbon nanofiber. Here, ammonia gas sensing properties of cobalt. Okay, sure, sir. Come, come to the summary. Or... Okay, okay, sure, sir. Okay, I am coming to summary. and. From this work, I have summarized the following. The uh, P-type cobalt oxide nanoparticles were successfully synthesized using hydrothermal method. Carbon nanofibers were synthesized using electrospinning process, followed by heterogeneous nanofibers for effectively synthesized using simple ultrasonic sonication route. The pure and heterogeneous nanocomposite materials were characterized structurally and morphologically using XRD and STEM. Ammonia gas sensing property of P cobalt oxide, CNF heterogeneous nanofibers have been reported. The sensitivity increased. For retrojunction and a composite to 90 percentage when compared to bare material with the rapid response and recovery time. And these are the future works that is ammonia gas sensing properties towards various relative humidity ranging from 10 to 90 percent has to be to be studied. Cross electricity of um, B type cobalt oxide, CNF, retrojunction, and fiber have to study to study the stability and repeatability of the as prepared ammonia sensor. Ammonia gas sensing mechanism with the energy and band structure have to explore. 
and I like I would like to acknowledge I Icon uh, 21 SRM University for giving me this platform for presenting my work and also my research supervisor Dr. BPG, Associate Professor, PhD Institute of Advanced Studies and Mr. Uh, Professor uh, P. Radha Krishnan, Director of our P, uh, Institute, PhD Institute of Advanced Studies and the managing uh, PhD Managing Trustee and the officials of officials providing me the opportunity and facility to carry out my research work. And thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there questions to the talk? I, I have a short question. Okay. Um, when you compare the sensitivity, is it uh, normalized to the same material of uh, cobalt oxide or to the same mass of the total um, sensing material? The uh, total sensing material. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Other questions? No, then thank you very much again. Okay, thank you. And uh, then we come to the third talk that is by Harita about voltammetric determination of hydrogen peroxide using MOS2 modified Class C carbon electrodes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We see your screen already. And okay, I can start the presentation. Yes, please. So, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. I'm Harita, a research scholar from Department of Physics, University of Kerala, uh, working under the guidance of Dr. Raki Arbi. Uh, the topic for the presentation is voltammetric determination of hydrogen peroxide using a most modified classic carbon electrodes. So moving on to the presentation, it will include an introduction uh, to hydrogen peroxide then synthesis and fabrication of MOH2 classic carbon electrode, then structural and morphological characterizations of MOH2, then electrochemical studies of MOH2GC for the detection of H2O2 and followed by the conclusion. So moving on to the introduction to hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide is a reactive oxygen species that is present in the human body. It regulates uh, various physiological processes such as cell growth, migration, differentiation, immune activation, etc. The normal level of hydrogen peroxide in the human body is between between one to five micromolar and uh, but higher levels of H2O2 that is greater than 50 micromolar is cytotoxic. It causes an oxidative stress and it will lead to the cell damage and it's a biomarker for uh, various disorders such as cancer, atherosclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, etc. So the detection as well as a quantification of hydrogen peroxide is an essential uh, thing. There are many conventional methods of detection like uh, fluorimetric assays, spectrophotometric assays, etc. But as compared to the conventional methods, the electrochemical method of detection offer advantages like simple operation, cost efficiency, cube determination, high sensitivity, and high sensitivity. So in electrochemical biosensors, a key component is the electrode material. So the electrode material uh, should have a uh, good conductivity as well as a high surface area. Transition metal dichalcogenides are a new class of materials which is having good electronic, electrocatalytic as well as optical properties suitable for the biosensing uh, application. Among the various TMDs, MOS2 is a popular transition uh, metal chalcogenate in the field of biosensing since it is a graphene analog with high surface area conductivity as well as enhanced catalytic properties. Although MOS2 is an interesting candidate, uh, the 2D MOS2 uh, faces certain uh, limitations like the restacking of the atomic layers. So that will limit the number of active sites for the uh, electrochemical reaction. So uh, through this work, actually, our goal is to highlight the benefits of 3D MOS2 microspheres uh, by studying the electrochemical uh, properties for the detection of hydrogen peroxide. So moving on to the synthesis and fabrication of MOS2 glassy carbon electrodes, the MOS2 uh, microspheres were synthesized by a simple one-step hydrothermal method. And then for the fabrication of MOS2, uh, glassy carbon electrodes, actually, we have used a simple drop casting method that is just by diluting the moisture powder in ethanol and affluent mixture and just drop casting on the electrode. And a uh, three electrode measurement was used for the uh, electrochemical studies uh, with AG, AGCL as a reference electrode, uh, platinum as a counter electrode, and moisture GC as a working electrode. 
then moving on to the structural and morphological characterizations the structural characterizations of the material was done by using xrd analysis the xrd spectrum uh, shown in the uh, figure a uh, it confirms the formation of hexagonal phase of mos2 and no impurity peaks were present uh, the scm images uh, shown in figure b and c uh, shows a uniform distribution of mos2 microspheres with an average size of uh, 0.97 micrometer moving on to the electrochemical characterizations uh, prior to the electrochemical determination of h2o2 actually we have set we have done a set of uh, electrochemical characterization to study the electron transfer mechanisms and all uh, in uh, uh, by using a redox probe, uh, potassium perocyanate. The first figure actually shows the EAS plots, electrochemical impedance spectroscopic plots uh, for the Bayer GCE and MOS2 GCE. From the EAS plots, actually, we have calculated the charge transfer resistance values, and they were uh, recorded as 262 ohm and 23.02 ohm. As compared to the Bayer GCE, the MOS2 GCE is having a lower charge transfer resistance value, which indicates the higher conductivity activity of the MOS2 microspheres. Uh, later, we have also done the uh, cyclic voltammetric studies of Bayer GCE and MOS2 GCE in the presence of uh, one millimolar potassium ferrocyanate. So uh, for the MOS2 GCE electrode, we observed an enhanced oxidation and reduction peak current values, which indicates the catalytic ability of MOS2 microspheres. So, then moving on to the electrochemical detection of hydrogen peroxide. So the electrochemical detection of hydrogen peroxide has been done by using cyclic voltammetry. The first figure A, it shows the CV curves of Bayer GC and MOS2 GC in the presence and absence of H2O2, in the presence of uh, 50 micromolar H2O2 and in the absence of H2O2. As we can see that uh, in the absence of uh, H2O2, no reduction or oxidation peaks were found in the CV curves. But in the presence of 50 micromolar H2O2, actually a cathodic reduction peak is observed for the MOS2 GC electrode. This indicates the electrocatalytic reduction of hydrogen peroxide in MOS2. So then to study the kinetic behavior of uh, H2O2 reduction on MOS2, actually we have varied the scan rates uh, in the CV studies from 10 to uh, 100 millivolts per second. Uh, as we can see that when the scan rate is increased from 10 to 100 millivolts per second, the reduction peak current also increased. This means that the electrochemical reduction is a kinetics controlled process. Uh, then actually, uh, then after that, uh, the um, linear plots are also plotted between the peak current versus scan rate as well as the peak current versus square root of scan rate. From the correlation coefficients, actually more linearity is observed between the peak current versus square root of scan rate. This indicates that the electrochemical reduction of H2O2 in MOS2 is, a, is an irreversible uh, diffusion controlled process. Then uh, moving on to the next slide. Actually, uh, then in order to find the number of electrons transferred in the reaction, we have also plotted a graph between uh, peak current as well as logarithm of scan rate. And by employing the Lagrange method, we have calculated the number of electrons transferred in the reaction. So it has been found to be 2.3, uh, and it actually it validates the reduction of H2O2. Uh, then moreover, we have also calculated the adsorbed surface concentration of H2O2, and the graph is plotted between the adsorbed surface concentration of H2O2 versus scan rate. We can see two, that the, two more minutes. Okay, we can see that the adsorbed surface concentration of H2O2 decreases with increasing scan rate. Then um, in order to find the analytical parameters like the linear range, detection limiter, sensitivity, and all, actually we have varied the H2O2 concentrations from 10 to 100 micromolar, and we have uh, coded the CV responses. Uh, so we can see that as the concentration of H2O2 is increasing, uh, the peak current also increases. This again validates electrocatalytic reduction of H2O2 on MOS2. Uh, then from the calibration plot, a linear range is obtained from 10 to 100 micromolar with a detection limit of 1.15 micromolar and a sensitivity of 0.456 microambient micromolar is to minus 1 centimeter is to minus 2. 
then conclusions fsl hydrothermal route is used for the synthesis of amorphous to microspheres then amorphous to glassy carbon electrodes were fabricated for the non enzymatic detection of h2o2 the sensor displayed a linear range of detection from 10 to 100 micromolar with a detection limit of 1.15 micromolar with good sensitivity reproducibility and repeatability uh, so these are the future plans the real sample analysis as well as interference studies acknowledgements and thank you Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there questions? To the talk, I, I have one question in the slides where you had the um, slope of um, against the concent uh, against the um, scan rate in the cyclic voltammograms on the bottom. There was four. Yes. Uh, what was what is the difference between C and D, the plots? Actually, C is the plot between the peak current and the scan rate, uh, mm -hmm. and the D is the plot between a peak current and square root of scan rate. Ah, okay, the square root of yeah, square yeah. root of scan rate. So, in order yeah, to find yeah. whether the process, yeah, yeah. Is yes, whether it's so, okay, okay, okay. I understand. Yeah, yeah, and it agrees more, more with the square root, and then you conclude that mm -hmm. it is the yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Okay, are there other questions from the audience? Just raise your hand or speak up. It seems not the case. Okay, then thank you very much again. And thanks uh, all the speakers of the session. And I guess we, we close the session, right? <laughs> uh, on behalf of the uh, ICON 2021 Organizing Committee, I uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Wolfgang Kuch and uh, for chairing the session and uh, concluding on time uh, exactly. So, also I thank uh, Professor uh, Corrado uh, for his uh, wonderful invited lecture and also other two uh, contributed lectures by uh, Mr. Rajesh and uh, Ms. Harita. Okay, also I thank all the participants for attending this uh, session. Maybe. So now with that we will conclude we conclude this uh, session. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.